I'm really excited um, to, to welcome Joel Malley. Let's give Joel a round of applause. I first met Joel back in like 2000, I believe, uh, through a City Voices City Visions project we were both working on. And um, I've had the opportunity to spend a lot of time in this classroom over the years um, to work with him closely. And I, I, I can tell you we're very lucky to have him here today. Joel um, has managed to create the kind of classroom that we all aspire to. His students feel valued, they engage in work that's meaningful to them. He's constantly pushing himself, he's involved in a variety of different professional organizations. He's very well respected here locally and nationally uh, through his work with the, uh, the National Writing Project. Um, Joel's going to talk a little bit about uh, the work that he's been doing in his classroom. And um, we're going to have some time. I think we're getting a little start late, um, a late start. We're getting maybe about 10 minutes, hopefully, for discussion. So if you have questions along the way, please jot them down. I think uh, discussions after talks like this are really important. I will direct you to the slide up ahead. This uh, event is sponsored by the West New York Network of English Teachers, which is a peer-driven social network. And I just want to recognize the officers that are here today. Uh, Scott Ryan's in the back. Scott is the treasurer, I believe, West New York Network of English Teachers. Scott, you teach in Albany, too? Uh, yeah, I teach in Albany, uh, Ryan's Friend College, and I guess we'll see you very busy. And I saw Shannon, Shannon Burke-Kurkowski. Shannon is the Vice President of the West New York Network of English Teachers. Shannon, you're currently working at Elwood Village, Charter, Elwood Village School. Charter School. And Amanda Walro is here, and Amanda teaches ELA at AIS at Maritime Charter School. Are there any other officers? Here, these folks have worked tirelessly to get this organization off the ground. And we have, you know, teaching is under fire in many ways. I think back to the Wisconsin um, debacle and the protests and the, the attempt to smear teachers. The, these people have worked very hard to bring us together and create a network that supports meaningful learning and teaching uh, regionally. And I think that you know there's a lot of good things happening in education. We have to spread the word. And I think our strength is in our members here and the connections that we can make. So we really hope that you consider joining our organization. There's a forum if you'd like to become a member in your brochures. We also have a very active Facebook page. Could you click through real quick to the Facebook page? Um, you can visit us on Facebook. There's about 103 members now at that last uh, check in. It's a place for us to exchange ideas, ask questions, share resources. Um, so that, that material is there. I won't say much more. Uh, Joel, welcome and thank you. I'm going to start. <laughs> All right, so, anyways, uh, it's good to be home. I, uh, as Jim said, I, I went here. I graduated in 2000. I did my master's here as well. I uh, graduated with, with, with my master's degree in 2005. Um, and I'd like to say the place looks familiar, but I don't think I've ever been in this building before. I think they chain English majors down to catch them and they never let them leave. They never let them leave. Um, and just taking a look around today, I just, I just realized how little my life has improved. Like, back in 2000, I didn't have enough quarters for the visitor's parking lot. And today, I went to park there and I had no quarters for the visitor's parking lot. So I had to park behind the art gallery, as usual. At least I got a little bit of walking in. All right, parking joke, check. All right, so I am here to basically tell you a little bit about my classroom, tell you a little bit about what my kids are doing. Um, and I want to thank Jim for that wonderful introduction. What he says is true. I started teaching after doing a year of subbing. I started teaching um, at McKinley High School, uh, you know, <laughs> three doors down to your left. And uh, at the end of my first year of teaching, I met this other teacher named Keith Hughes, and he said, hey man, do you want to learn how to teach teachers how to, uh, I'm sorry, how to teach students how to make digital videos? It's like, you're going to get a free computer, you're going to get a free camera, you're going to get like $800 for spending two weeks in the summer. I said, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. So I got involved with City, Vis City Voices, City Visions, this, um, this organization, uh, the partnership between UB and, uh, and the Buffalo Public Schools. And then the next year, I got involved with the Western New York Writing Project. And the reason why I'm even black gathering on about all this is because those professional connections have helped me do something I think is important. It's helped 
keep me in the conversation about where our school should be and help me kind of hold on to good ideas in a time of a lot of bad ones. Because um, I would make that argument that right now in education there are a lot of bad ideas floating around that are being grasped. And maybe we'll talk about some of those today. Um, the first thing I want to do is make the argument to you that what I do matters, is that this idea of digital writing matters. So I teach in what I like to call digital writing workshop. I'll tell you what I teach in just a couple of minutes, but this is how I like to describe you know, the, the way my classroom is. Um, problem is, right now in the landscape we're in, digital media is viewed in a couple different ways. So when you go out into the classroom, and I'm just imagining that a lot of us are teachers who are going to be entering the classroom, maybe just entering the classroom, but we're dealing with this landscape, right? Uh, the Framework Institute, this think tank, just did a, an examination of all these different professional organizations and all these different surveys to find out, well, you know, what do people think about digital media? What does your average layperson out there think about digital media? What are the people who are writing about education saying about digital media? Okay? And this is what we have to contend with. Americans see digital media, whoops, as recreational, those kids with those video games, they're just sitting on couches, right? They're, they're doing really nothing. Um, they think it's a passive use of time, couch potatoes, growing obesity problem. This is the, some of those things that are, that are connected to this idea of digital media. Uh, they see it as a distraction. These kids should be out. Um, they should be out to, you know, playing football in the streets. They should be talking in class. They should be doing these more social things. Um, and also a distraction from the basics. Don't these kids need to know how to, you know, learn to read and write and so on and so forth. So this is some of the perceptions of your average layperson out there on the street. Um, and then, you know, you've got these people who think digital media is, well, it's downright dangerous. These kids get on Facebook. What if some pervert sees their profile or something like that? And whether we like it or not, when we enter into the classroom, these are some of the ideas that we will have to contend with, either outright or just kind of like, you know, these kind of like subconscious things that people are dragging with them. This is your average layperson. The media kind of adds a little bit more to this. They publish stories, Dateline on BC, about, they, they reinforce some of these ideas. The problem is that the deeper message about technology, about digital media, about digital media composition, is it really getting out there? It's always a shallow interpretation of what's going on. So hopefully, through our taking a look at some of this today, we'll come to some a little bit deeper understanding about what it could be. Now, I planned on this slide being lower and bigger, so I'm going to have to scurry up to the top so I can read a little bit. Um, but the experts see a different story. Many experts, when polled, see digital media composition and digital media in the classroom having a variety of benefits. I'm just going to read a couple. I'm not going to subject you to all that. Um, but they say that we live in a different world right now, that our kids need different tools to be successful. They say that the 21st century world and job market requires new skills and that this emerging story of digital media and learning helps kids develop those 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 tools those skills um, they think that the way we do schools is broken and I've been there for 12 years and I say yeah I think a lot of this stuff is uh, in need of some serious re-examining they say that students need context and meaning for learning we know that from Frera we still you know none the more true today um, they say that digital media allows us to do a number of different things. It helps us make our classrooms more personalized. It helps kids tell stories in ways that are more relevant and more powerful to them. It does all these things. I'm going to make that slide available since it is so small and the report that is contained in on the Western New York net tonight. So if you want to take a look through the entire report, you can. A lot of other people have weighed in as well. Daniel Pink, in his book, he came out a couple years ago, A Whole New Mind. If you've not read it, it's great. If you've not read Drive, it's also great, about motivation. Um, but he said the future belongs to a very different kind of person with a very different kind of mind. Creators and empathizers, pattern recognizers, and meaning makers. These people, artists, these people, artists, inventors, designers, storytellers, caregivers, consolers, big picture thinkers will now reap society's richest rewards and share in its greatest joys. So he was examining, well, what did the 20th century look like? Now what does the 21st century look like? We live in this information-rich society. What skills do kids need to do? How can they be successful in this world? 
And that is one of his takeaways. But he's not the only guy saying stuff like this. Ken Robinson, I'm sure you've seen this video, but just to snag a little portion of it, he said, we think about the world and all the ways we experience. We think visually, we think in style, we think kinesthetically, we think in abstract terms, we think in movement. And when I think about the digital writing my kids are doing, a lot of the stuff that they do is tapping more so into that when they're designing in multiple modes instead of just you know, doing the traditional writing, um, you know, word processing. Jeff Wilhelm said, being literate has always meant the capacity to use a culture's most powerful tools to create and communicate meetings. If you're not teaching with technology, you're not only not preparing the kids for the future, you're not preparing them for the present moment. Reading and writing don't fix no Chevys, and he has this to say as well. Even though we are in the midst of the core common standards movement, which I'll get to in a second, in 2010, our federal government released a report when it said whether the domain is English language arts, math, blah, 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 21st century competencies and expertise such as critical thinking, complex problem solving, collaboration, and multimedia communication should be woven into all content areas. So why does digital storytelling matter? Even our friends over at the Common Core, vague as they may be, so as not committing to anything. They said the students should be able to use technology to produce and publish writing and to interact and collaborate with others. So what I do is definitely in the Common Core. They say our state added develop personal, cultural, textual, and thematic connections within and across genres as they respond to texts you written digital and oral presentations employing a variety of media and genres. And lastly, the Common Core said that students should make strategic use of digital media, textual, graphical, audiovisual, and interactive, and presentations to enhance understanding of findings, reasoning, and evidence, and to add interest. Whoop. Let me go back for a second. So those are all the things that this Common Core says specifically, explicitly about digital use. But when you take a look at the types of writing my kids do in the classroom, it is argumentative. argumentative. It is informative. Uh, the, the, it is narrative. It is the types of writing that are in the Common Core. All right, the last reason why I'll state to you that digital writing matters is because people, kids, are telling stories all the time. And if we don't teach them, you know, how to tell digital stories, they'll figure it out on their own. And when they do, the picture I think stands for itself. All right, so anyways, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my core beliefs, just for a second too, because I think it'll help frame everything in this presentation. And I also wanna say, you know, a lot of times people leave college and they're like, man, what I learned in college doesn't relate to my classroom. But I can attest to you that everything you're going to see right here was developed in my mind in, in Dr. Bontempo's methods class, or in Dr. Riegstad's teaching writing class, or in my field experience with Dennis Watazic. So everything, I, my core beliefs right here were shaped right on this very campus. I think that that's important to acknowledge. All right, so some of my core beliefs that will kind of sift through this entire presentation are that for me, learning is an active skill-based process. I am not a, someone who is filling an empty vessel. My kids are intelligent. I want them working. I want them to have a production-centered classroom. Uh, for me, one of my core beliefs is choice is important. When my students read, depending on the class they're in, not so much AP literature, but in the other classes, I give them a wide variety of choices because I know that that's a motivating thing. And I also know that, well, they have a lot of different skills and things like that, but even when I do writing tasks, they get a lot of choice because you need to believe in what you're doing and I think allowing that little bit of freedom you know, helps them find topics that they're interested in. Uh, I know this sounds passe, but my classroom is a community. We read together, we write together, we look at all our stuff together. Um, when it's operating at its best, we are a community of people. Uh, I also do workshop pedagogy, which means that kids work in my class. Kids write in my class, kids read in my class. I work with readers and writers in my class. I sidle up next to them, I kneel next to their computers, we conference at tables. This is a, a vision of what my classroom looks like. 
I also write with my students a lot of times when I have to do when I do projects if I don't have good samples of past student work I will do it myself uh, even when we're writing poetry or other things I write because I know that the only people who know how to teach writing is writers and so, like you see this example right now, wind, shoulders, and sails. When I had to have my students understand what I was looking for in the final project, I made an example for themselves, but also to figure out like the problems they might encounter. So I write with my students as well. I also know that I'm getting kids with varying ability levels. I mean, I just got the results back from a reading test about my kids, my ninth graders. And I have ninth graders on the 12th grade reading level, and I have ninth graders on the third grade reading level. And I know that the same book's not going to work with every kid because how could it? So I know that when I go into it, I'm going to need to work with different kids with different things and no prepackaged, prescripted curriculum is ever going to address the needs of every single learner in my classroom. Uh, so as such, I do a lot of point of need instruction. Um, I do a lot of, hey man, you really need to work on this, you individual. And I also do a lot of mini lessons based on student need. If I see a problem crop up, like the nine dumbest things my kids are doing, that I will design some sort of mini lesson to kind of address that and then hold them accountable. So invariably, at the end of every presentation about technology I give, I am asked, well, how do you teach grammar? Well, that kind of gets at it right there. I teach grammar at the point of need, uh, mini lessons based on some targeted skills and then some other stuff that, that I feel is important as well. And the big picture is practice yields proficiency. You know, I can only lecture a kid, if I, if I lecture a, a, you know, a weightlifter, I could lecture him all day on lifting weights, but unless I left them, let him lift weights, he's not going to get any stronger. I can lecture a kid about different cooking techniques, but unless I let him cook, you know, he's not going to become a better cook. Too many uses of the word cook. Practice yields proficiency. All right, so I'm going to show you some videos right now. I'm also going to talk to you about the framework of my class. Like, what does a digital writing workshop look like? What does a whole year look like? What does your average typical project look like? Then I'll show you some samples of some work my kids have done. All right, so these are the tools that I work with. I realize that I am in a very advantageous position in one of my classes. This used to describe all of my classes, but now, whoops, I've been kind of limited. So I work at one class, one period a day, my digital writing workshop class, where I've got 13 kids and 15 computers, and they can sign one of 15 cameras out from the library. Not that that's really important anymore, because every kid's got like the iPhone 5 and, you know, all the goodness that can happen with that. But for one class, I've got all these tools to work with. And I'm a very lucky guy, and I have a very small class, and kids can work individually. It's super awesome. My other classes, though, AP Lit, my English 9 classes, which are my largest classes, I have five computers, you know, the situation you most frequently see people working in. Uh, five computers in my classroom, um, kids are competing with these cameras from, you know, the senior electives, they, you know, ordinarily can't get them. So I am in a much different position in my other classes than in my digital writing workshop class, and it does affect the different types of things we can do for sure. The courses I teach, as I've mentioned already, English 9, uh, AP Lit and Composition, Digital Writing Workshop, each class is really different. We do different things because they have different goals. A lot of the projects I'm going to talk to you about today are from Digital Writing Workshop, uh, probably an equal amount are from the AP Lit class. My AP Lit class, I know my kids have to take an exam at the end of the year. They have to do a lot of close reading. We also discuss books that we're reading in common because they signed up to do that. But Digital Writing Workshop, they sign up for a different experience, so that class looks a whole lot different. Um, your general digital writing project kind of looks like this. Just like every other writing project, we start off in the pre-writing. Students jot down some thoughts and blog posts. They, you know, figure out their ideas, and then we kind of move through. They gather and write, they storyboard, they do this kind of things, they gather footage. Um, while they do that, they're constantly editing and revising. I'm talking to kids throughout the entire, let's say, two or three week project. And then finally, we screen all the films at the end. So that's what your typical project looks like three weeks, four weeks, depending on, you know, what's happening in the midst of it. If it's a research project, is there more involved? I'll also say that, well, actually, I'll just save that. Okay. So, digital tools. I just wanted to talk a little bit about what I do for uh, 
the pre-writing phase, we're using, I'm sure you guys use stuff at Buff State like this as well. We use Schoology uh, for our online, you know, our, our little social network thing. Um, our social network thing. My students uh, get involved in discussions. That doesn't have a blogging feature, so that's kind of changed what I've done. But um, you know, kids do their thinking on there. They discuss on there. They trade ideas on there. It might be about a book we're reading. It might just be about a project we're working on, trading ideas, generating ideas that way. But uh, right now we're using Schoology, which is an awesome tool for the classroom. Hopefully they won't make you start paying for it and you'll still be able to use it. Generate story ideas, discuss issues. Okay, this is low stakes writing. I don't go through and fix every single little error. I just respond to them as writers and thinkers. So um, this is not something where I'm circling spelling errors and, errors and grammar mistakes. Although if I do notice something crop up, I will address it. Um, what's cool about this is not only are they getting feedback from me, their teachers, they're getting feedback from each other, although you can't see it from, from the screen grab that I chose. You know, if your peers are interacting with your words and you know your peers are reading what you have to say, you're more careful and thoughtful about what you're saying. I always have a question of privacy. I can't really attest to it right now because Schoology is a closed network. Uh, but in the past, I've had my students working on Ning and working on groups and working on, um, you know, blog or where it has been public and open and anybody who had that URL would find it. And I've never really concerned myself with privacy. And I don't know what I would say to any questions about that. Other than repeat that last thing. All right, so anyways, that's what the early pre-writing looks like in a digital writing workshop class. Now I'd just like to briefly talk about what my kids do traditionally. Uh, their writing. What does traditional writing look like in my class? The drafting, editing, and revising uh, phase. I got my kids use Google Drive now, no longer Google Docs, but if you're not using this, I'm sure, how many of you are using or at least familiar with Google Docs? Okay, so I won't waste my, won't waste my breath. But they use that, and this allows me to do a number of different things as a teacher. It allows me to give them feedback throughout the process of writing. Um, before, what did you do? You handed in a draft and, you know, you, I mean, the good teachers, the good teachers you'd hand a draft to into. Here's my first draft, they'd give you some feedback, you'd be able to go back and revise it. You know, other teachers would be like, here's the final draft, then you get it back full of red, right? But what Google Docs does is it breaks down barriers. I can have a kid send me a message on Friday night, hey man, can you look at my lead? Or hey, can you look at this conclusion? Or this feels wonky? And I can hop right on there and do that if I'm not doing other things. Um, it's breaking down these kind of like, these, these bar traditional barriers uh, to communication. Uh, what's also cool is I can take a look at a draft, I can take a look at a kid's thinking and see, all right, as it evolves, it's like, okay, how is he approaching this task? Um, you know, what, what, what do I need to address with this writer? How can I give this kid the feedback he needs when he needs it? In common throughout the progress of a writing piece, I kind of just said that. But it also renders this question of plagiarism moot, right? Because if I watch a kid's piece of writing evolve, you know, he's not pasting it, copying and pasting it from anywhere. I've seen it evolve over the course of a two-week project or one-week project that is, you know, taken completely out of the equation. It's also cool as you get kids working with each other. Now, I don't know if you see the little error up there. Erica Johnson, 77, has not just shared her writing piece with me. She shared it with five of her friends to take a look at. Not because I asked her to either. It's like, here's this piece of writing I'm working on. We're a community. They're kind of like sharing these pieces in a good way too. Not like, uh, hey man, you know, if we're working on writing pieces, it doesn't really make sense to copy what other people are doing. But at least you get a sense of, you know, the type of writing or uh, something your buddy is doing good you want to emulate. There's also chat, which works out really well. Keeps my classroom a little quieter if kids are chatting about their writing pieces in the sidebar as opposed to chatting out loud. Uh, a couple on a couple of instances, like every year, usually we'll do a collaborative project. I'll have my seniors do a research project, and they'll kind of write that paper together. They'll research together, they'll compose together, and they'll they'll collaborate in that way. And this tool makes it really easy to do that. Uh, it also makes summative assessment really easy. Um, 
I can, A, I type a lot better than I write anymore. I can't string together two thoughts by hand, you know, and if I could type out my comments, I'm that much more likely to really say what I'm looking to say. Um, but it also makes it really easy. I can copy and paste the rubric right at the bottom. So I can, if you see the bold Troy, I remember the night and the following days very well. That's my feedback at the bottom. In the sidebar, I can comment on focus specific things. Then in the bottom, I can give them a general sense of their overall proficiency or mastery or whatever. Also, if I'm feeling up to it, I can say, hey man, you can revise this, get it back to me. Um, maybe you want to fix some of the errors, like if this was the final draft that they were handing in, a kid really wants to make it a little bit better. I'm totally open to that. And what's really cool is what makes my life a lot easier is I can just take a look at the revision history and kind of say, all right, this is how this document has changed. You know, uh, how has it changed the overall meaning and, and so on and so forth. And think about it that way. Also, plagiarism totally prevents all right, so big picture too, my kids also put together portfolios, right? So I want them to be amassing materials over the course of the year so that I can demonstrate and they can recognize their progression as writers. And so Google Docs make this very easy. I can do a nested folder with all my kids' folders. I can share that folder with my student teacher. If I had a department with a bigger goal in mind. It would be very simple to share these portfolios with all the teachers in the department. Um, that way when we get a kid, we can take a look at what they did in the past, get a better sense of, you know, that kid is a learner, learner, a better snapshot. That's very complicated. It hasn't happened yet, but it could. All right. So, next thing I want to talk about is writing in multiple modes, some of the digital writing my kids do. Um, this digital writing workshop class where I'm able to spend all of my class um, working on writing that is, you know, different than traditional writing, it takes it, I would argue, a little bit further. The writing under is the, is, the, is the foundation of everything I do. You know, whenever we do a writing project, we traditionally write and then we enhance it with these tools. But this is kind of the progress of my digital writing workshop course this year. We started off just doing a little Prezi, right? And then we did our college essay. We wrote our college essay and then we used digital tools to enhance it. We turned it into a little podcast. They record their story. Uh, some even recorded like little interviews of parents and stuff that went along with it. Music, sound effects to take that story to the next level. Um, right now, the election today, yesterday, tomorrow, they'll be interviewing people about you know their thoughts on the election, any inquiry question that they want to know the answer to. So right now, they're working in groups to kind of capture this moment in time and then produce something out of it—a short little three-minute podcast, kind of telling the story of the inquiry question they were looking into. After this, we're going to, work, we're going to rock on a, a profile documentary, which is simply you interview somebody, shoot B-roll to go along with it, do a little research about why you chose to interview that person too, right? So like some kids are doing like, hey, my grandpa is a concertina player. They do a little research on whatever topic is associated with that person because they've got to find somebody really interesting to interview. Um, after that, we move more to a narrative film, and I'm going to show you examples of all these in a second. Uh, we do some persuasive, argumentative uh, film work. We do commercial stuff, which is also persuasive and argumentative. And then we stop with a research-based documentary before their final project, which is totally open choice. You know, we explore all these genres over the course of the year. Now, make something you care about, you choose. So that's kind of the overview of the entire year. Um, <clears throat> So I think that like, when I think about digital writing, I think about what my kids are doing. I always talk about multiple modes, right? So kids are designing in video, they're designing in interviews, but they're also bringing sound in, they're also bringing music in, they're also bringing title screens in and transitions in. They're making all these decisions about how to tell a compelling story, right? <coughs> If they're writing narration, it's more, they're also including this more traditional uh, type of writing. But this is kind of why I think this is such a powerful, powerful writing tool is because kids are making all these decisions. I'm doing this because it will produce X effect. I am impacting my reader, my audience this way. 
And what's cool about these projects, which I'll talk about in a little while, is there is an audience. You know, we watch everything that's screened. They take their films afterwards and they put them on Facebook or on Twitter. Hey, check out my thing. So they know they are creating something that won't die at the bottom of my desk drawer or in my little bin thing that are always disorganized. <laughs> they will, they, you know, they're making stuff for an audience. Especially parched today, I don't know why. All right, so I think I just ruined this next slide, a publication. Um, like I said, we watch everything. What I'd like to do right now is show you a couple of projects my kids have done, kind of explain what these projects are all about, and then I'll uh, end with some things and we'll move on to some questions. Jim, what time do I have to? Uh, about quarter after. Quarter after, oh good, good. I might skip through some of these. Anyways, this first project, pause. This was an AP Lit project, right? So we're studying the romantics, we're reading Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, all traditional stuff, right? Reading some Wordsworth, reading some Keats, that kind of thing. And I said to my kids, hey man, uh, wouldn't it be cool if we took some of this poetry, this romantic poetry, and reimagined it, right? So what does this mean that the romantics thought nature was restorative? You know, what do all these things mean? So I had them break up into groups, we took a look at specific poems that they chose out of you know, a number of different choices and then they reimagined them for the screen. Uh, this was a two week project, we were doing other things in the meantime, but they went out, gathered footage, came back, brought it in, we kind of alternated talking about Frankenstein and working on the film and this is an example of such of one of the projects that came out. Season of mist and mellow fruitfulness. Close bosom friend of the maturing sun, conspiring with him how to load and bless. With fruit the vines that around the thatch eaves run. To bend with apples and lost cottage trees and fill all fruit with ripeness to the core. To swell the gourd and plump the hazel shells with a sweet kernel. To send body more, and still more, later flowers for the bees. Until they think warm days will never cease, for summer has overbred their clammy cells. Hedge crickets sing, and now with treble soft. The red breast whistles from a garden croft. And gathering swallows twitter in the skies. Mm. Okay, so very basic project. Whoop, pause. Arr! Okay. So a very basic project. Here are the words, you reimagine them, right? And that's pretty much in digital writing workshop and filmmaking terms, that's probably as simple as you go. Um, hey, here's a poem, make a movie out of it. You know, you don't have to do any writing, you just have to pick the visuals, the music, that kind of stuff. You have to perform it, which I think is really cool. You know, saying the words with emphasis, because that's what the best projects do. Um, so that's what we did that year. And you know what, we had the conversation when we screened these films, you know, why is it important to film to screen films. It's important to, you know, take a look at what each other has done. Um, but my AP kids, I'm not really concerned that they grow as filmmakers throughout the course of the year. That's like one of my minor concerns. <laughs> my bigger concern is, you know, I hope my kids can um, talk about romanticism. I hope that they can really dig deeply into a poem and do a close reading. And after we talked, after we screened this film, we got to talk about, you know, autumn as being a time of overabundance and overripeness and, you know, how sad that is. And after that, it's, you know, it's a time of death. And um, that conversation happened a long time ago. But I remember walking away from that with a new understanding of autumn. I never really thought about that. I never really thought about how leaves, you know, in autumn are as bright, or as bright as they're ever going to be. And then after that, they're dead. So that always eluded me. I don't know why I never made that connection. It seems like a simple connection to make, but I didn't. And I think that, you know, this kind of storytelling helps. The next year, and I think this was last year, we, instead of having them pick a poem to analyze and make a film out of, I had them write their own poems. We went to Rhinestein Woods. If you've not been there, it's awesome. Lily Ponds, Chitawaga, Nature Preserve. Uh, in fact, they had some um, uh, evening grosbeaks there the other day that I went and saw. I've never seen that beard before. 
sorry, dark woman. Uh, anyway, <laughs> we went there and we did a little one day field trip and I had my kids write and film and then we came back into the classroom and edited. So another cool project is, hey man, uh, write a poem and you know, go make something of it. So here's an example of that. On such a gloomy day, one does not expect to find inner peace. Yet each raindrop falls in its own way. Each tree sways with such ease. The leaves beginning to turn as the season begins. It creates an irreplaceable scene. Nature is a perfect harmony. One must long to fit in. One must long to be as free as the birds, to breathe in such brisk air, to up and go at any second flying high above the treetops, indifferent to selfish troubles, living with such an inner peace. I'm so sorry. That's the sound effect to my slides going backwards. <laughs> Hold on. All right, so anyways, I'm all out of sorts here. What I'd like to say about that project right there is, you know, the conversation about Victor Frankenstein chilling out in a boat, you know, after he finds out his brother's been killed, becomes really different when you get to think about, you know, the, what that person had to say about, about nature and it being restorative and being calm and peaceful and, you know, this romantic ideal. So that's an example of one of those poetry projects. Um, we also do narrative projects, which is more like uh, kids tell a story and then shoot some stuff to go along with it. Uh, I don't know where this project is from. I might have to hit play again to see. Okay, so I'm going to pause it again. This project right here is an example of a film. We were studying The Awakening by Kate Chopin. Again, another really traditional thing. I apologize, but I've always liked that book for some reason. And so in exploring this, and then I think we read Emma, which was their choice, not mine, and I'll never make that choice again. But we then decided to explore this idea of gender, right? So here is uh, here are these two, two books about, you know, about gender roles and things like that, and you know, let's explore it in our own lives. So this kid wrote this little essay about you know, how she saw gender operating with her own life and then made this film that kind of went off that. Just 
So, I mean, if you think about like all the different decisions, like her writing in the, in the first part was, you know, her speaking, her telling her story. And then, so how do you redesign? How do you, how do you, you know, use all these multiple modes to tell an effective story? So with AP Lit, what we'll do is we'll spend, I call it um, the five minute primer to cinematography, right? So I know these are some skills the kids will need to think about, they probably haven't thought about them. You know, camera angles, framing, this type of, this, this type of thing. So we'll spend five minutes talking about that, I'll show them some slides, we'll discuss, and then it's move on, then it's go out and film. With Digital Writing Workshop, we'll spend a little bit more time because that's more central to what that class is all about. Um, so we'll take a look at some samples, I'll make them watch some, um, you know, watch some This American Life segments, the, the Showtime version, uh, with the sound off so they can really concentrate on the visuals and we'll talk based on that. Um, but as far as like from a, from a design standpoint, it's, you know, here's a little bit you should know and then you go out and play, go out and exercise, go out and cook and then we'll take a look and we'll all feast on your meal later. I'm, I lost that metaphor. But this is the type of thinking that, they, that goes into this. Um, I don't overload kids with button pushing instructions in the beginning. I show them a couple of things and I let them get to work. Um, and if I notice that I need to address something or a new skill, uh, then I'll go ahead and do that, um, you know, in, 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 in the flow. All right, just got a couple more, not to overwhelm you. So that's a narrative project. project I like to do with Digital Writing Workshop is for them to make a commercial and I encourage them as much as I can to make a commercial about something that will actually be useful. You know, find somebody who needs, to be a, needs a commercial made. Uh, make a commercial for something you need, you think needs a commercial made of it. So this, these guys did their hockey team, they're like, yeah man, we need a commercial for the announcement. So it's this task, it's a genre that exists in the wild, right? There are really commercials out there, they're making a commercial, but the other thing is it's got authentic purpose. What are they doing? They want to, you know, drum up excitement for the hockey season. So let's take a look at this one. I'm going to play this and then we'll talk. This is a profile documentary.
this credits. Kids love credits. If they knew I was cutting their credits off, they'd hate me for it, but I have to. Um, so just a couple words about that. Um, first of all, there were four kids who worked on that, four kids who were depicted in that video. One kid in my senior elective working on the project, and then there's a couple different kids he filmed shooting. Just the one interview. But the sad story is that three of those kids, three of those boys, dropped out of high school. Not the kid who made the video. Now, I don't mean to oversimplify an issue, because I would definitely be guilty if I was saying there was a direct causality there. But I'm wondering, so we get these guys in our classrooms, um, and we don't give them access to these tools if we have them tell the story in the same way that we always have, and we wonder why the results we get are is the same as they've always been. I don't know, I think that there's something there. Uh, the other thing I'll tell you, just in case you're worried, because a lot of people are like technophobic, like I didn't step into this digital filmmaking thing as a filmmaker, right? On the first day when I, I sat down to make films um, with, Jim, with Dr. Sircone back in the, in the, you know, leading us, I had no exposure to it whatsoever. I played some Nintendo when I was a kid, but that was pretty much the original, and that was pretty much the extent of my technical skills. I wasn't a computer savvy dude, I'd never done anything like that. But I learned when I, as I went. And with most things, with this, with podcasting, with any digital tool you, you use, you gotta tinker. You gotta be a producer. You gotta be a designer yourself. And if you do, if you play with these things, I think your life will be, you know, I think, I think this really enhances a lot of stuff. And uh, so don't be intimidated by the schools. It's just they're the tools, because it's just button pressing. And if you press a button long enough, you'll figure it out. And that's kind of what I had to do. And a lot of times, kids know more than me. And uh, I gotta kind of act like I know something. Or when I'm a more responsible teacher, um, you know, highlight that that kid knows something and have them demonstrate for the rest of the class and acknowledge my own ignorance. So there's only one more film I got, I have here that I'm not, I'll show you a few minutes, just not the entire thing. The reason I'm even showing it right now is because I think it addresses something important. The Common Core uh, really, really focuses in on kids doing multiple research projects a year, right? And the importance of research. And to me, I can't sit up here and argue against that. I know that research is a very important skill. Kids will go to college, they'll have to research. Kids will go out in the real life, they'll have a lot of things they'll need to find out. You need to know how to do all these things in order to do so successfully. So, uh, I have my kids every year, they do a really, you know, they do a traditional research project, and then they make a film, uh, this kind of, weaves their research into that film. So I'm just gonna show you a few minutes just so you can get a sense of what that's like. It's only four minutes long, but I'll show you like two. Facebook has become the most visited website in the United States, and millions of people all over the world are logging in every day. Facebook has more than 400 million users worldwide who log on daily to stay connected. Teens spend an average of 31 hours per week on the computer, not including their cell phones. We surveyed five random teens asking them if they had a Facebook. The unanimous answer was, yes. So why is Facebook so addictive? How you can see what all your friends are doing at once. There's pictures from stuff you've done with your friends, and there's new, there's new people you can start talking to. Because new people, they're in my face, and it's just such a new way. I've been bored at home, and I'm curious. Communicate with different people. It's a nice little bit of a list. Children, teens, and adults everywhere are becoming obsessed with staying connected. Some people are even being diagnosed with FAD, which is Facebook Addiction Disorder. <laughs> I'll pause it there. Just uh, this was done two years ago. That's why it's not a Twitter video. That's why it's you know that's why it's a Facebook video. So um, yeah, you know, kids do all this research and then they've got this paper written and they say, okay, how can I redesign my message in order to tell a compelling story, you know, for this audience? And a lot of, I would argue, deep thought goes into that. Um, all right, so final conclusion like takeaways. Uh, digital writing matters, I would argue. I would argue all these things 
Um, I'm going to stop right there for a second. I would argue that, you know, this word engagement gets a bad rap sometimes, but it really just means motivation, right? Uh, Daniel Pink in Drive, that book I referenced earlier, he says that for regular people to be motivated, they just need three things. They need autonomy, mastery, and purpose, right? They need to know that they have some choice and some say to choose what they will be you know, using their time for. They need to know that they will get better at that thing that they're doing, which I think that you know, the more practice and more proficiency. They also need to know that what they're doing has purpose. They're doing something important, something that matters. And I think when we take writing, I mean, I know that I'm a writer, right? I write on paper, I word process, I blog. And I think that like, I know that writing is important. I'm not gonna argue that it's not, but I think it helps them see it more when they take it to the next level and enhance their story. It helps when they're telling, you know, this authentic task business helps increase engagement. They are making genres that exist in the wild. That's super important. And I have always, you know, I always notice that my kids throughout the course of the year, I get probably about, I would say, totally unscientifically, 40% of the class come to have this identity of themselves as filmmakers. They can do this thing. They can do this once thought to be impossible thing, and they find out that they're really good about it. They're really good at that. And a lot of these kids you're seeing in this video today, you know, end up at Buff State in the media department, or they end up at UB in that filmmaking department just because they start to see themselves in this, in this fashion. Uh, digital writing matters because it's connected writing. They're writing for an audience, which is extremely important. The audience of their peers and that, that writing can go elsewhere. Um, I also would argue to you that when kids write and they know their writing is going to be viewed on the blog or on the screen, they really care about the revision. They really care about their voice or originality. My classes become almost like a competitive place where kids are trying to top each other. They've got these filmmaking skills and and they kind of see what each other is doing and you know they're always in this kind of sense of competition to try to tell you know a more compelling story they see who's good at it and they want to become good too and I think that that really is another reason why this type of digital writing matters um, and lastly just because this writing in multiple modes is really important if you're making kids design and make decisions and not just you know words and letters but um, and all these other ways that human beings communicate I think it's a very powerful learning tool a uh, thing that I'll end on is <clears throat> most of these things, most of these, uh, all the stuff that I'm talking about today, if you're interested in following up, uh, connectedlearning.tv is a great website. Uh, it's, good, it's an examination of these principles of what classrooms should look like. Classrooms that are production-centered, interest-driven, have a purpose that span kind of generations and, uh, you know, parents, other community things and stuff like that, is rooted in peer culture, um, but also has this idea of academic rigor. So if you're interested in following up, that's a great website to look, look at. And uh, I promise you that, as I said, if you go to Western New York Net, tonight I'll have a link to the Connected Learning TV site as well as um, that report that I referenced earlier. ConnectedLearning.tv? The Facebook page? Oh, the Facebook page. <laughs> That's all I got. Sure, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, so take about two minutes, actually, to have a good conversation. And I know many of you have some questions for Joel, so please um, stick around. We'll try to end for a few minutes. I know some of you have to take classes or back to work, so. Um, Take a second, we'll look over the notes if you're taking the right response. <laughs> Show me. <laughs> Anybody have any questions for Joel? And uh, Joel, again, if you could. Oh, yeah, I will repeat your question if you ask it. That is what that conversation. Right here, stationary for two photo. Okay. <laughs> Just raise your hand if you have a. <coughs> yes. Okay, the question was, what grade level do were my kids in digital writing workshop? That is a senior elective. Um, now, the, the good thing is that if, um, you know, the numbers, sometimes juniors get in there as well. Like every year I seem to have like two to three juniors taking digital writing workshop, which is really cool because then the next year they get into one of our other senior electives uh, that they can be here today, but John Frederick and uh, Kristen Pastore, they teach, and so they got these really skilled filmmakers coming in to 
to help out too. So it's traditionally a senior elective. Yes? How do you like, adapt the new technology to incorporate it right away, or do you play with it first? Okay. Did everybody hear that question? That seemed, that seemed like it was really, how do I adapt to new technology? Do I, do I play with it first or do I implement it right away? Uh, I am kind of scattershot with that. I have to see the purpose behind a tool. I've used lots of these little tools in my classroom and lived to regret it. Not like really deeply regretted it, but like things like Wallwish or Inglogster, which I'll use and then I'll examine it after the fact and I'll be like, you know, that I really have the usefulness that I wanted it to. That's why this digital writing workshop isn't having, you know, any of those types kind of kept it to the useful tools. So my straight answer to your question is, often I leap before looking. <coughs> sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But the reason I feel confident leaping before looking is because I have played around so much. Um, you know, all this practice that I've done in my own life and in my own, um, in my own classroom kind of gives me that confidence. Sometimes I regret it, sometimes it works well. Yes? How can we incorporate nonfiction expository texts into a creative curriculum like this? I've had a lot of good experiences with poetry and the personal reflective pieces, but with the Common Core, like they're really, really getting us on like the history of turtles or something. You know, like how can we take something like the history of turtles and make it funny, creative in a way that uses this technology in the so the question was, how can we use the history of turtles and make it fun and interesting? No, the question has to do with expository text. So, yeah, right? I mean, poetry, you know, poetry, give me a break, this common course, whatever. Um, but the question it has to do with, like, so what do we do with these more traditional academic texts? And it's a great question. But I think that this stuff can work for for really anything, if it's specifically the history of turtles, have a kid write a voiceover uh, telling about the history of the turtles. You know, depending on what grade that kid is in, if he's a senior, have him go film some turtles or something like that. But it, depending on your situation, if you're in like a, a classroom that's got you know a computer for each group of four, you know, I mean, starting them off with writing the voiceover, uh, finding some music, finding images that go along with it is a great first step. Um, and I think like expository text, like, so what would that, so that would like, would, um, what am I, what am I thinking of right now? Like uh, all this, this historical text, like the Declaration of Independence and that kind of stuff, like how do we do that with digital video? Would that be also a question? My AIS kids are more like facts about so just writing information. Yeah. Well, what about a process essay? I mean, I don't know if that's something you would do if you did kid explains process, shoots shots to illustrate process, so you've got the process essay, but then the visuals that go along with it. Yeah, that would be in our sequence. Hot snot. Giddy up. <laughs> what questions? Yes. So how do you address the common core technology aspect in a classroom that doesn't have the resources? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, so I think that that is one of the reasons why the Common Core is purposefully vague. Because if it wasn't vague, they would have to buy technology for all of us to use. And I think that, um, you know, I don't know, I, I know the conditions that I teach in. I mean, one of the things is, I mean, I taught in Buffalo. When I started teaching in Buffalo, I had one computer and one camera, and I found ways, right? Um, and then when I moved to having three cameras, I'm sorry, three cameras and three computers, I found ways. And then some years I'd have to go to the computer lab, um, and some years I'd have to secure a laptop of carts. I'm sorry, a cart of laptops. <laughs> and um, I think nowadays, you know, depending on your schools, you know, um, how they approach technology and what they'll allow. You've got all these kids with smartphones. I think that that, like this year, that's what I'm really experimenting with in my digital writing workshop, is um, having kids use their phones um, and seeing what we can do with that and kind of turning a lot of the responsibility on them for recording and capturing it that way. Joel, could you mention, I know a lot of you are probably thinking, well, I'm not going to have 15 computers. And I remember those days when you had one computer. You developed uh, something called a one-shot. Mm. Um, that became a pretty popular genre. And the one I'm thinking of is a student who made a film, a one-shot film about the road not taken, where she's walking down the hallway. Can I move? May, may I move now? You told me yeah. to stay on this spot. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so, and like, I mean, if you're a thoughtful educator, you say to yourself, all right, what does the core common standard say? 
uh, I've got these tools, like how can I design a project that will help the kids meet the standard? And so back before the standards, you know, there was the New York State standards, so this will be a reference to that, but I had my kids, um, you know, do this one-shot project where every kid, it was an initial project, every kid took, you know, a 15 to 30 second shot that they thought captured a quote. We did this other type of project called the video quilt. Um, and what that was is uh, all my kids did research projects, right? I search projects. It was McKinley High School, 2004, and what I had them do is, out of their research project, um, I had them pull one quote. Like in the world today, they did research projects. I'm sorry, I remember as I'm going. I apologize. But in the world today, blank is happening. You know, seals are getting their fur ripped off or whatever. Um, so in the world, so the movie became this one camera over in the corner of the classroom with a with a with a camera and a computer attached, and the kid would come up and somehow represent what was going on. So this film was a collection of that. Uh, what did that do? I kind of made this neat little thing that we were all kind of working on, and I would think elevate the report and the research a little bit more and I mean I, it's been a while so I haven't really thought deeply about how that impacted you know these common core ideals but I guess you just kind of make do and you do what you can I forgot who went to ask that question but. Well, so in my district, the official policy is that cellular devices are not allowed. <laughs> so I do it on the down low. <laughs> and sometimes I've caught heat, and sometimes it goes under the radar, and it's always best to seek forgiveness and permission, as long as you're tenured. <laughs> yes? Coming from like an LN standpoint, how could you effectively integrate technology in the same kind of mastery way, but without just producing film products. Because I gave a kindergartner a camera, probably won't get it back in the same condition that I gave Yeah, until. definitely. But they could still, like, is there a way that you thought of that could still do, have the same end product? So, like, I'm just thinking about some of those tools that I don't use but that are available out there. I'm, like, I'm thinking about Animoto. So like you get a group of kids together, they're doing a research project about sea turtles. They find some, you know, they find some pictures of sea turtles and they put it together in this web application called Animoto and it makes a 15, 15 second slideshow. You know, that's the kids starting to take these initial leaps into design um, and thinking about the message that they're getting across. So I think that would work. And I think that, I mean, it's, your, your question is very important as was the other question about what do you do if there's no technology. I mean, you've got to teach the reality you live in. You've, in, in, in my class looks different even from my senior class to my ninth grade class because of the conditions that I'm in. So you've got to examine the conditions, think about the tools you have, what you really want to accomplish, your core beliefs, and then do something that you feel you know is important and also is possibly related to a standard. We have uh, time for one more question. And again, I hope you all find the Facebook page, Facebook page for the Western Network be a place to continue the conversation. Does anybody have one burning, one burning question left? Yes. Um, you, you stated how uh, your uh, ninth grade class had like choices with the books they're gonna read, mm -hmm. and your AP class doesn't. Like, is, is it like strict because they're gonna have to test at the end of the year, so it's like really no choice? Okay, so the question is, my ninth grade class, they got total choice about the books they're gonna read. My senior class, um, my AP Lit class, I make them read the same books. I have had years where I've opened it up a little bit more to AP literature, um, but in my freshman class, I look at them like this. I'm like, here's this bunch of kids who are from all different levels and they're curious about something. So I say, you could choose your own books. I've got all these little guidelines and things like that and uh, ways that I keep them accountable. But it's like, that's that class. That's what I want to help develop readers. That's my purpose. AP literature, we share the same readings. And I tell them in May, when they're going to sign up to take the class, I'm like, listen, we're going to read the same things. Um, we're going to take a look at books together. And I think they sign up for that experience. And it also provides us, I mean, the big thing is it provides us an opportunity to sit and close and talk about a, a book we've all closely read and have a shared common experience around a piece of literature. And they've signed up for the experience. And I try to make it more participatory and, you know, not lecture-based. I'll lecture maybe 
you know, 10 minutes a week on something that I think they should use to look at it. But most of the time it's what I got from Professor Landry uh, here many years ago. Send an email, but in my case it's, you know, blog posts. I take a look at what they've said, I pull some quotes that I think will push our discussion further, and we sit down on Monday and Tuesday we talk about these ideas that they're already having. So even though it is more traditional in the sense that we're all reading the same thing, it's all kind of generating from the student curiosity, student interest, and student observations.